Welcome to another episode of was this <laughs> becoming a techno wizard? And it's been so long since I did a video. So sorry. That's completely my fault. I've just uh, completely uh, dropped off. Um, one, I, uh, it's, it's a reason, but it's really an excuse because I could have been using Zoom this whole entire time. Um, but a big re reason why I, I haven't been doing this is because uh, Loom, the tool I was using before, uh, which I like better than Zoom, suddenly changed everything so that you couldn't record videos longer than five minutes on the free plan. And um, I don't have the money to be buying, you know, the whole service, especially because I don't use it for that purpose <laughs> for what Loom is built for. Um, so couldn't use that. I've been on the lookout for a bunch of other tools to kind of uh, see what's out there and see what I like. Um, couldn't find anything. You know, a lot of these tools are, don't really do everything. Fruit flying here, goodness. Don't really do everything. They only cover maybe just the screen or, you know, they don't record the audio or something like that. Um, or they, they look very sketch. <laughs> um, there's one tool that looked promising, which I, which I was just about to do called Movavi. But turns out, you know, they say, oh yeah, download our free, you know, our free version. And I, of course I had limited, you know, things. And I was, I was looking at that. I was saying, okay, I could, I could work with that. And if I liked the tool, I would definitely consider buying it, you know, once I finally, you know, have enough. But I download the tool um, and, it, and it says it does have a watermark. So I was like, okay, I, I, you know, I'm not sure. It didn't show anywhere on the website what the watermark looked like. So I figured maybe it'll be off to the side or something like that or whatever. Download the tool, getting everything ready, click record and say, hey, hey, if you want to take off the watermark, you know, buy the free version, buy the, uh, the, the other version. Turns out the watermark is a huge thing in the middle of the screen, a huge thing. So you literally, it's not even, it's not even like discreet or, you know, off to the side. It's a huge banner in the middle of the screen. And then what made it even worse is that it turns out the free version is just a seven day free trial. Why they didn't point that out anywhere on the website? I don't know. That, that, that's a, that reeks of dark patterns to me, and I really don't like that sort of thing. So I'm just like, uh. The, um, there was another tool that seemed promising called Screen Wreck. Yeah, I was looking at this tool. Um, and this one seems really promising. This one is free as well, um, but unfortunately, it's not available on Mac. <laughs> and I'm stuck on Mac right now. But it looks promising. It looks like they make their money from another. This is like one part of the product that the that the company makes, and um, that's how they make their money. And I, I guess they're going to turn this into like the whole point of this is for cloud storage and all that. They're probably going to make a play with that. Um, but it looks promising. Looks pretty good. Looks has all the features that I want. So when this creates a, a Mac version, and uh, I said in October, I might go ahead and try this one out. So, uh, yeah, but anyways, going to jump off right where I left off in the anarchy book. Um, aren't people naturally competitive? So if you, if you, if you recall, you could probably read, you know, watch the other videos, but talked about aren't people naturally selfish. And this one went into the fact that no, people aren't, we've been for a long time. We've had plenty of different societies and peoples built upon, you know, collaboration and, um, free kind of a gift giving economy and things like that. And um, this was this was very uh, eye opening, very awesome. This one is going to be interesting because I have a theory. I have a, before I even get to read this, I have a theory that competition is kind of overblown, right? And this is going to be a, a a you know hot take, if you will. I know a lot of people are going to look at this and be like, well, no. Um, but my theory so far, maybe it's just an idea. Because um, I haven't structured it in a way that, that's test testable yet. But um, my idea is that competition is just an illusion and just a kind of tool that we, that we use. Um, but the really important part is the collaboration, right? When you look at, <clears throat> when you think about a competitive environment or competitive companies or anything like that, like capitalism and stuff like that, I don't think the 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 things that we the progress right the things that we've gained from capitalism or any sort of competitive system is due to the competition right i think it's due to the collaboration and 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 that 
the competition just um just uh became a tool for collaboration for companies for groups organizations you know to work together to collaborate on something uh for a shared mission for a shared goal whether that goal is to beat somebody else or to be the best or to to produce something really great you know um perhaps that goal was sort of competitive but <clears throat> i don't think competition is is the key you know factor in here and and the reason i say that is because yes you can make an argument that um competition is key in in collaboration right and in, in getting people to collaborate but i don't think so you know i think we just currently have stumbled upon competition as a as a method of getting people to collaborate but it's not the core you know reason or method in which we do collaborate i'll, I'll give you an analogy there are different ways to persuade people right to do things for instance there's coercion you know there's uh, which is like intimidation blackmailing you know all these kind of negative aspects of of getting a persuading people to do something kind of forcing people to do something versus there is um kind of uh persuasion a more ethical persuading like right right um reasoning logic you know science the scientific uh process and things like that you know these are kind of more ethical uh ways of of persuading people um there's a course of course other ways and it's gray kind of um a lot of gray in this area too but the point is that there are different ways of persuading people just because intimidation like is an effective way doesn't mean it's the most effective way or the most ethical way likewise i think competition is one way to get people to do things to collaborate to create things but it's not necessarily the best way nor is it you know the only way i think especially in our current society i think collaboration is actually the the kind of root of what makes um progress and things to change and all that other stuff and competition is kind of the name we put towards it because it's it's uh the the it's easy to think about right or rather it's it kind of hooks into our brain and which has a natural focus towards i want to say negative things or towards you know uh, xenophobia and, and and um kind of in group clicks and and things like that it kind of it's, it's kind of hacking into our brain right to think that competition is, is is everything competition 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 when really it's the collaboration aspect but that's my that's my idea so far we'll see what they say here and um, I definitely want to, you know, refine that idea later on because I do think you can do it in such a way that is that is testable. Because and and I think if we figure that out, we can make much better organizations and and systems. So we'll see. Anyways, it's been <laughs> like what five minutes, ten minutes of me talking. Let's get into the book. Aren't people naturally competitive? In Western society, competition is so normalized. It's no wonder we consider it the natural mode of human relations. Yep, from youth. We're taught that we have to be better than everyone else to be worth anything ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> that's changing. That's changing a lot these days, but you can definitely make an argument that yes, that's the case. Corporations justify firing workers, depriving them of sustenance and health care so the company can stay competitive, right? Fortunately, it does not have to be this way. Industrial capitalism is only one of thousands of forms of social organization humans have developed. Beautiful. And with any luck, it won't be the last. Yeah, <laughs> obviously humans are capable of competitive behavior, but it's not hard to see how much our society encourages this and suppresses cooperative behavior. Okay. Countless societies throughout the world have developed cooperative forms of living that contrast greatly with the norms at work under capitalism. By now, nearly all of these societies have been integrated into the capitalist system through colonialism. Colonialism, goodness slavery, warfare, or habitat destruction. But a number of accounts remain to document the great diversity of societies that have existed. Yeah, this is beautiful. You know, this is another reason why I've been recently kind of getting to the realization that capitalism really does kind of ride on propaganda. It rides on this concept that capitalism is the best thing since sliced bread. You know, it's the only alternative, right? Um, if you get into like the Reagan Thatcher type of type of idealism, that capitalism is the only way that capitalism is the only thing that we can use and we have to think to thank for progress and for, 
you know, um, much of modern society. But in reality, you can see that it has a huge amount of negative consequences that we don't really, you know, give give it credit for, right? Let's credit, if you want to credit capitalism for a progress, let's also credit capitalism for many of the things like colonialism, you know, slavery, warfare, like literally all of this feeds into capitalism. And people will make an argument that, oh, no, warfare, uh, slavery, all this was due to governments. It was due to imperialism. It was due to this, that, and the other. But when you look at the systems, like, no, it, it, was, it was capitalistic at its core. Like, it's literally the control of resources, right? Let's, let's go into, I don't know if we want to do this whole tangent right now. Maybe I might, I might have to say this for now, because this is a long chapter. Yeah, I'll go into the tangent later, because I have a whole thing about capitalism. And again, I'm not an anti-capitalist or whatever. I'm just a person who, who is looking to understand ideas and systems and, and societies and see what really we can use, what's really good, what's really bad, with the pros and the cons, and, you know, build something from there. Um, I'm not, and I, I, had, I think I have to say that because it's, it feels like every time you criticize capitalism, people see that as a, as a as a crime or something like no it's blah 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 and they get all uppity about it and stuff and I think that's very that's very dangerous that's very dogmatic you know we have to criticize our systems we have to figure out what went wrong what is right and really you know go from there but you know I'll do that at another date let's let's continue this the Mabuti hunter gatherers of the Ituri forest in Central Africa have traditionally lived without government accounts by ancient historians suggest that suggests the forest dwellers have lived as stateless hunter-gatherers during the time of the Egyptian pharaohs. Beautiful. And according to the, to the Mabuti themselves, they have always lived that way. Contrary to common portrayals by outsiders, groups like the Mabuti are not isolated or primordial. I hate that, you know. Like, oh, they don't have a society. They don't, they're not civilized because they're, you know, hunter-gatherer people. When they if you give them the time, if you actually look at the culture, you, you'll see so much rich, uh, such a rich tapestry of, you know, civilization of, you know, t education and, and um, invention and innovation and progress and change and all this other stuff that they have um, and sustainability, the fact that their culture has existed for millennia, not just centuries, not just generations, but thousands of years, right? And the only thing that has recently, you know, given it trouble is capitalism. And again, people are going to see, you know, that as an excuse to say, oh, doesn't that mean that capitalism is better? No, like bullies, you know, go and take people's lunch money. It will beat up, uh, you know, other people that take their lunch money. Does that mean that bullies are good? You know, does that mean that bullies are better? No, <laughs> you know, we look at that. We, 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 it's just so weird to me because like, it's, it's a similar, very similar metaphor and an and analogy, right? Like, it's just so, it's just so weird to me because people make this argument all the time. They say, oh, you know, the Mabuti or these hunter-gatherer tribes, you know, since their system was destroyed by capitalism, you know, the, since it wasn't able to compete, right, with capitalism, doesn't that mean capitalism is better? But if we, if you consider, if you, take that same exact argument and put it in school or put it in the workplace and say, oh, your boss or your, or your, your coworker or your, um, a fellow student, a peer, you know, if they bullied you, you know, if they went and took your money, if they put your head in the toilet and stuff like that, it, they outcompeted you, right? They, <laughs> would you say that they're better? You know, it, it's just, I don't know. It really boggles my mind that we, for some reason, people don't make that connection and don't realize what they're actually saying with that type, with that type of argument i don't know but it's, it's very interesting so uh where was i in fact they have frequent interactions with the sedentary bantu peoples surrounding the forest and they have had plenty of opportunities to see what supposedly advanced societies are like going back at least hundreds of years mabuti have developed relationships of exchange and gift giving with neighboring farmers while retaining their identity as the children of the forest. That's beautiful. I actually, start, I actually uh, use these folks as one of the um, main groups I wanted to do in, in, in one of my, um, I'm not, I'll have to talk about that at a later date as well, because I'll go into a whole other tangent. I've been basically, I've been trying to write um, or ideate a, a, a really world build 
an entire society, um, or really a, a story verse for Afrocentrism, uh, really Afrofuturism, rather, you know. Um, and uh, I have to, yeah, that, that's just another topic for a whole other thing. But yeah, I definitely appreciate the Mobutu have amazing things, the Bantu as well, you know, a lot of these different African civilizations. And um, I would love to see more about them because they have a lot to teach us, you know. Today, several thousand Mobutu still live in the Turi forest and negotiate dynamic relationships with the changing world of the villagers while fighting to preserve their traditional way of life. Many other Mobutu live in settlements along the new roads. Coltan mining for cell phones, Coltan? Coltan, Coltan? Uh, for cell phones is a chief financial incentive for the civil war and the habitat destruction that is ravaging the region and killing hundreds of thousands of inhabitants. The governments of Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda all want to control this billion dollar industry. Yeah, that produces primarily uh, for the US and Europe, while miners seeking employment come from all over Africa to set up camp in the region. Yep. <laughs> the deforestation, population boom, and increase in hunting to provide bush meat for the soldiers and miners have depleted local wildlife. Lacking food and competing for territorial control, soldiers and miners have taken to carrying out atrocities, including cannibalism against the Mabuti. Some Mabuti are currently demanding an international tribunal against can cannibalism and other violations. Wow. That's messed up, man. That's really rough. Again, we can get in this whole argument, oh, isn't capitalism better than because you know, we, we were able to go in there and get what we wanted. I'm like, no, no, it's not, it's not better. It's, it's terrible. It's really unethical, you know? And um, I know some people will, will still, you know, support the cause of bullies or the cause of coer coercive environments and competition, you know, the role of the jungle, you know, um, even though that whole thing is a misunderstanding of what that even means, the role of the jungle. Um, and that's something we really have to figure out. Like, how do we, how do we talk to people um, that consider this type of behavior as acceptable? You know, there's people that will consider this competition, you know, as acceptable behavior, as any, mean ne any means necessary to win, right? They see that as acceptable, you know? And, and to me, that, that is the biggest problem with our society today is this complete obsession with winning you know, at any cost, when in reality, that winning is really myopic, right? It's short-term gains, because inevitably, inevitably, these zero-sum wins, these, you know, winning at every, any cost, you know, leads to destruction, leads to not just the destruction of the people that you destroyed, you know, as, as is evident, but the destruction of yourself, right? It, it it creates a revulsion in a in a it, it creates a erosion of your empathy of your compassion of your ability to connect with other human beings and if that doesn't you know make people think what it really does is it creates a deadline for your society right just like what we see today like you, we competed so much we've extracted and and taken out so much that the environment collapses, right? Because you didn't pay attention to sustainability. When you said, oh, we, we, we need to win at any cost. We need to do whatever it takes to, you know, to win to get these resources. And then you exploit the resources. You do so in a way for short, for all these short-term gains and victories and wins. And then what? And then, you know, the environment can't replenish, right? Then environment collapses and everything else collapses with it, including your civilization, you know, the civilization that we created, that you created. And so, of course, people then, you know, turn around and say, oh, that's not going to happen. Oh, climate change is not real. Oh, you know, <laughs> whatever. But it's so sad because for certain people, it feels like it t it's going to take literally the end of the world before they even can admit that they were wrong. And that's not something that we can allow right because if it really gets to that point like it seems like it's getting to then there really won't be a way back like wh what are we going to do from there you know if we wait to literally the last minute where everything's burning and there's no you know 
water, you know, there's no fresh water, there's no clean air, and people are bottling up air, like, like certain places in China, Canada, selling them bottled air because their smog is so bad, you know, like, what are we going to do? I don't know, again, probably going on too many tangents, but this, uh, this, this chapter is really hidden, really hidden. So let's continue. Um, Europeans traveling through Central Africa during the colon colonization of that continent imposed their own moral framework on the Mabuti. Because they only, they only encountered the Mabuti in the villages of the Bantu farmers surrounding the Ituri forest, they assumed the Mabuti were a primitive servant class. Wow. In the, 1950, the, in the 1950s, the Mabuti invited Western anthropologist Colin Turnbull to live with them in the forest. They tolerated this rude, his, his rude and ignorant questions <laughs> and took the time to teach him about their culture. The stories he recounts describe a society far outside of what a Western worldview considers possible. Around the time that the time that anthropologists and, sub, and subsequently Western anarchists began to argue about what the Mabuti meant for their respective theories, global economic institutions were elaborating a process of genocide that threatens to destroy the Mabuti as a people. Notwithstanding, various Western writers have already idealized or degraded the Mabuti to produce arguments for or against primitivism, veganism, feminism, and other political agendas. I wonder what those are. I hope they'll, they'll get into that because I'm, I'm really curious to see, you know, um, what they're talking about here and what specific um, arguments they have. In my in my understanding of the Mabuti, I know I'm taking tangents, but, you know, this is kind of the point here um, as well to kind of digest this stuff, because um, I have looked into the, to the Mabuti a little bit um, in my own research, and I know that they do, they have um, fairly progressive things in terms of feminism, for instance, where, you know, it's fairly egalitarian with everybody, um, but that's the same with many ancient, you know, um, many African cultures with ancient roots, with hunter-gatherer roots, is that they are very egalitarian, you know, men and women, can can get married or divorced for for whatever you know it's not this this idea of property of owning your wife or something like that and um they have uh, a lot of interesting ways of, of doing their culture like you know their historical uh stories they tell through oral means and people you know kind of poo poo that as uh primitive you know because they don't have a writing system um but I'm not sure if the Mabuti do themselves, but I know many of these cultures actually do have a writing system, but they, pr they have proven that the oral system is actually more effective at record keeping, at, tr at or rather at communicating um, generational knowledge, right? And we see this today. I talked about this a little bit in my podcast, so I'll, I'll probably just link that. But um, like even to this day, we, we, sh we use podcasts, music, and um, videos and all this other stuff as a more efficient way of teaching people and of communicating knowledge rather than just pure writing. Like this writing is great. It's, it's cool that I can read this, but many, many people have not read this. You know, many stories are more efficient when you hear them from other people. When people talk about these things, like you've probably heard of, you know, all these Romeo and Juliet and all this other stuff. And sure, you, you probably read it, but what stuck to your mind was when you seen it, was when you heard it, when people were, were you know, acting these things out and stuff like that, that sticks in the human mind much more effectively than writing. And so many of these cultures realize that and they use oral traditions in order to pass on that information, pass on way more information far more effectively than you could if you just use writing systems, which, you know, might I add, is, has a huge problem of, you know, storage. Like, how do you store all this writing? We see this even today with computers, right? As much as we we love how much computers can hold and how much data is there. There's this real problem of, of internet archive where we don't really know what's going to happen to the internet if, for instance, you know, um, certain servers get, you know, messed up or, or anything like that, or if, you know, certain server farms get uh, flooded or, you know, people can't access the internet for some reason. Like, what happens to all that data? And if, if you look at this, you know, 100 years or 1,000 years in the future, when, we, when, we're, when we're using new methods of storage, you know, what happens to that? Like, how do you translate all of this data that has been coded, you know, in binary and everything like that to whatever the new realm of storage is? You know, people are going to have to think about how this is going to work because this, that, that's the problem. With, that's what made the Internet so 
um, powerful, right? From the 90s and to the early 2000s was, was, was Google and other people, not just indexing the web, but actually scanning books, you know, taking all those books and putting them in digital format. And there's a huge problem today because there's still a huge amount of books out there that have not been scanned and, and are not available on the internet. And that's a huge amount of data and information and knowledge and history lost, all right? Just because it's not digitized. And so the same problem happens um, before you had writing, right? Or before you had printing, right? People had to physically write these things, you know? So you have to think about how all of that data was, you know, recorded, how it was stored, you know, how the communication, um, because when you write something, I'm sorry, my background is very loud, but when you, when you write something in a certain language, right, you have this problem of, of, of translating that language generations down the line. Like most people can't read Shakespearean language. Most people can't read books written a hundred years ago, much less a thousand years ago, you know? Um, and so if you think about that in terms of a societal system, you can't just say, oh, a writing system is more advanced than an oral system because an oral system has a benefit of communicate of um, rather translation, right? It can take an idea that was um, your, your grandparents or your great grandparents and translate it, translate that to your own relevant um, present day, you know, understanding of that. And so that, that, that's a more effective way of passing on information rather than if you just write something, right? You have no idea what the context was. And if you just read it, you don't really know, you don't get that, that the, the, the uh, depth of meaning, you know, that the author meant when they wrote that thing. So it's 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 a pros and cons thing, right? Like not just because it's it 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 was invented later doesn't mean it's necessarily better, right? There's pros and cons to both approaches, and so it really bothers me when people when people point out, um, oh, they didn't have a writing system, right? <laughs> because it's it's not that simple. But anyways, let's continue. <laughs> Long tangent. Um, therefore, perhaps the most important lesson to take from the story of the boot. Of the, Mabuti, of the Mabuti is not that anarchy, a cooperative, free, and relatively healthy society is possible, but that free societies are not possible so long as governments try to crush any pocket of independence. Corporations fund genocide in order to manufacture cell phones, and supposedly sympathetic people are more interested in writing ethnogra eth ethnographies than fighting back. That's a very interesting point here, right here, you know. Um, like we're 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 complicit in in this in this uh, extermination of these people, right? If we say we 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 um want this progress and this growth and all this other thing and all this other stuff, but don't even don't protect you know the 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 history of these people, then what are we really doing? You know, and and this is a call for conservatives. You know, this is why I I personally feel like conservative conservative approach, a conservative kind of ideology makes a lot of sense. And we need that in human society. But if conservative, if conservatism is more focused on ethnocentric, you know, supremacy of, oh, this is how I do things. And this is the only way that this, this can be done. Then that's not really conservatism. That's just, you know, xenophobia. That's just um, supremacy. That's just, you know, it's not, you're, you're conserving your own ideas at the cost of somebody else's ideas that may have been older. Like many of these societies have older ideas, right? They, they have deeper traditions. And if you really care about tradition, why don't you value these? You know, why don't you conserve these? I think that would be a stronger kind of um, perspective and, and position of conservative ideology than whatever we have now, this dogmatic, you know, approach that we have now. Um, but again, that's another whole other story and tangent. In Turnbull's perspective, the Mabuti were resolutely egalitarian, and many of the ways they organized their society reduced competition and promoted cooperation between members. Gathering food was a community affair, and when they hunted, often the whole band turned out. One half would beat the bush in the direction of the other half, who waited with nets to snare any animals that had been flushed out. A successful hunt was the result of everyone working together effectively and the whole community shared in the catch. That is beautiful. That's beautiful. And we see this stay with organizations, right? The best organizations are collaborative. 
I have collaborative teams where one team is doing something. You have that specialization and stuff like that. And everybody's doing the things and you create amazing stuff together. Um, I know people are going to get into the argument of, oh, you know, it's better when people are competing to see who can do the best. Um, but really the best competition is collaborative competition, right? When you have this safe space of knowing that, yes, you can compete, but everybody cares, right? When everybody, when you know somebody cares about your well-being, then people don't get burned out. You don't treat people as just a resource. You treat people as, as people. <laughs> and so that's usually um, better in the long run. Maybe it doesn't, maybe, you know, straight edge, you know, um, uh, hard competition works in the short term, maybe, but often, almost every single time, it comes at the cost of people burning out and, and you know, learning to hate or, or just not want to work at that place anymore. So, um, yeah. Mobutu children were given a high degree of autonomy and spent much of their days in the wing of the camp that was off limits to adults. One game they frequently played involved a group of small children climbing up a young tree until their combined weight bent the tree towards the earth. Ideally, the children would let go all at once. I'm sorry. <laughs> let me pause this. The uh, partner's... Uh, um, getting me up here. I'm not sure if you saw all these messages, but <laughs> that was my partner. Um, she's on shoot for a little movie today, her first movie. Um, it's very, very awesome. But she's going to be there all day. She's been there all day. So, uh, yeah, we've been texting back and forth. But let's continue here. I'm not sure if I'll have to if I'll finish this. I need to stop taking tangents if I want to finish all this in under an hour or something. <laughs> it's probably already been an hour, but um, where was I? As a, one half will beat the bush, yeah. Children given a high degree of autonomy and spent much of their days in the wing of the camp that was off limits to adults. One game they frequently played involved a group of small children climbing up a young tree until their combined weight bent the tree towards the earth. Ideally, the children would let go all at once and the supple tree would shoot up right. But if one child was not in sync to let go too late, the child would be launched through the trees and given a good scare. <laughs> Such games teach group harmony over individual performance and provide an early form of socialization into a culture of voluntary cooperation. Ooh, this is beautiful. The war games and individualized competition that characterizes that characterize play in Western society provide a notably different form of socialization. This is a great freaking point, right? And that it's not human nature, you know, that we're naturally competitive. Most of this is taught. You know, most of this is indoctrinated in our cultural um, life, right? In the games that we play, in the stories that we tell ourselves, in the, um, the, the values that we have. You know, these, these cultures like the Mabuti, the, the, the Khoisan people, you know, they literally had um, collaborative culture where at the, at the youngest ages, they either taught or encouraged kids to work together, to be... Um, to be cooperative, to, to, you know, to do, you know, things like this, right? Like you <laughs> just think about this in a Western uh, society, like most people look at this and you're like, huh? First of all, we have a huge problem of helicopter parents in, in a lot of what Western society where this idea of a kid's only area, like play area is completely foreign to people outside of a, like a um, Chuck E. Cheese or a, you know, McDonald's Playhouse where you build it for kids and you say, go play over there. You know, you say, this is safe for you. And in many of these societies, right, today we might call this free range, you know, um, um, uh, raising, I guess, free range child rearing where um, we allow people, we, in, in terms of free range, we allow kids to go out and build their own playgrounds, right? To, to decide for themselves who they want to play with and how they want to play and all this other stuff rather than having this top down and I have to say patriarchal you know approach where we build the the, the playground for them where we, we say uh, this is what's safe for you this is what we want you to do and you can go play here right um, many of these societies they open that up we say no we want our children to be you know um, autonomous to be independent but also to be collaborative. And so we allow them to say, hey, yeah, go, go out, you know, this is your own stuff, you know, go take charge of what you want to do, you know, go, go play, go explore. And 
they encourage these these kids to to work together right um that was a, a deep part of their culture and so it became a part of their human nature rather but in our society in much of western society we have this idea of competitive you know whether it's these um today the natural the modern day version of it is video games right right people talk all the time about video games how video games is violent and all this other stuff but nobody's talking about how video games is competitive right how video games encourage people to have a zero-sum attitude to have an attitude that only one person can be a winner right this have this this idea that only you know certain people can win and everybody else is losers right you have this deep entrenched belief in this and it's not because it's human nature it's because we've indoctrinated ourselves to believe that right um versus in a and this, again this is just a modern version of it they, there was older versions with, with board games you know the game of life you know uh, uh the game of monopoly um all these other board games or or you know or arcade games before or whatever other types of you know um sports and things like that right uh i wonder if they're going to get into this because many different types of sports are different too like in many other types of societies different people had different types of sports like like for instance the koi san they had sports that were inherently collaborative where the goal was for everybody to win by by defeating by not really defeating but getting through the environment right by succeeding or getting over barriers or something like that like for instance you know the game of hunting it wasn't oh uh, the one person you know did the did the kill and so therefore that is the winner of the hunt the hunt it was that the entire group worked together to hunt something and when they did kill something it was for everybody right everybody partook in that in that thing everybody won and we see that today as a oh participation trophy right we, we it's so sad i think Right, where we see this idea that everybody can win as a um, as a soft or or um, bad thing, but in reality, it's it's trying to get back to this idea that collaboration is more powerful than pure competition, and it's it's a hard battle, right? It's a hard thing for people to think about. Um, and again, yes, competition has allowed us to to do some amazing things, but again, at what cost? It's like. You can't you can't say competition is is great without also you know mentioning that it also has created a huge problem of of lack of empathy, lack of compassion, you know this kind of um, narcissistic uh, encouragement of narcissism, encouragement of even psychopathic and or or sociopathic behavior. Like you got to take both, take credit for both things, you know. Um, but let's continue. The Mabuti also discouraged competition or even excessive distinction between genders. Mm. They did not use gendered pronouns or familial words. Uh, example, instead of son, they say child, sibling instead of sister, except in, these, in, the, in the case of parents, in which there is a functional difference between one who, give birth, who gives birth or provides milk and one who provides other forms of care. An important ritual game played by adult Mabuti worked to undermine gender competition. Wow. As Turnball describes it, the game began like a tug of war match with the women pulling one end of a long rope or vine and then and the men pulling the other. But as soon as one started, one side started to win, someone from that team would run to the other side, also symbolically changing their gender and becoming a member of the other group. Wow, that's interesting. By the end, the participants collapsed in a uh, heap in a heap laughing all having changed their genders multiple times. Neither side won, but that seemed to be the point. Group harmony was restored. Wow. I don't have to say, just think about that. Just, that's beautiful, you know? That's interesting. That's really interesting. Amazing. Um, again, we could think about what, 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 what's the pros and cons of that? You know, it's hard to say because kind of just destroying these people you know allowing uh deep levels of 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 violence and crime to to um destroy their way of life and stuff like that so it's really it's, it's hard to really say what the pros and cons of that approach is um but it seems like a really ethical and and more sustainable way of uh you know kind of building your society but i know people will disagree the Mabuti also discouraged, oh, I just read the part. Um, the Mabuti tra traditionally viewed conflict or noise as a common problem 
viewed conflict or noise as a common problem and a threat to the harmony of the group. If the, dis if the disputants could not resolve things on their own or with the help of friends, the entire band would hold an important ritual that often lasted all night long. Everyone gathered to, mm -hmm. together to discuss, and if the problem still could not be solved, the youth, who often played the role of justice seekers within their society, would sneak into the night and begin rampaging around the camp, blowing a horn that made a sound like an elephant, symbolizing how the problem threatened the existence of the whole band. Wow, that is wow. For a particularly serious dis dispute that had disrupted the group's harmony, the youth might give extra expression to their frustration by crashing through camp through camp itself, kicking out fires and knocking down houses. Meanwhile, the adults would sing a two-part harmony, building up a sense of cooperation and togetherness. Yo, that is, that is wild. And I know people will say, you know, a lot of stuff about this, but I honestly think that is some, that's, that's interesting. That's something we should think about. That's something we should explore, you know, that we should try to, we should see if, how this works in our, in our society. You know, if we, if we do things like this, where uh, you try to you try to get people go to go back into this state of harmony, you know, and, and to try to see is this problem that we have is is this dispute really that important, you know? Is it really that 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 much of a problem that you can't you know figure out a solution? Um, and if you think so, then then the kids rampage around and, and you know make all this noise and make all this fuss. Um, because a lot of times, and, and even to this day, right, even like we see all, all the time with our current society, and that younger people tend to have a, an idea of justice. Is it a better idea? I'm not sure. It seems to be a pure idea, right? We have this, uh, we have this idea that kids are pure, you know, that they have this inherent understanding of what is right or wrong or what should be right or wrong. Um, is it better? I'm not sure, but it, it sure is. It sure seems to get to a kind of deeper um, understanding, you know, of what is right. <laughs> so uh, that's that's definitely an interesting take. The Mabuti also underwent a sort of fission and fusion throughout the year, often motivated by interpersonal conflicts. The band would break up into smaller, more intimate groups. People had the option to take space from one another rather than being forced by the larger community to suppress their problems. That's another great point, right? Just because you have problems and you have, you know, dispute doesn't mean you have to, you know, come to a conclusion. You can split off and, and, and kind of do your own thing and see if that really is uh, better for you. After traveling and living separately for a time, the smaller groups joined together again once there had been time for conflicts to cool down. Eventually, the whole band was reunited and the process started over. It seems the Mobuti synchronizes social fluctuation with their economic activities. So their period of living together as an entire band coincided with a season in which the specific forms of gathering and hunting and hunting require the cooperation of a larger group. The period of small disparate groups coincided with the time of the year when the foods were in season that were best harvested by small groups spread throughout the whole forest. And the period when the whole band came together corresponded with the season in which hunting and gathering activities were better accomplished by big groups working together. So yeah, that, that to me feels like a very natural and kind of organic way to live a sustainable life, right? Rather than trying to force the nature, right? The environment to kind of do what you want it to do and to yield all the, all the uh, products and resources that you wanted to yield at every, every time of the year, right? which almost always comes at the cost of the environment and eventually ourselves, you work with it. You say, okay, this is, you know, not, this is a time of year when um, attitudes run hot or people can't, you know, come together and there's less resources. And so let's spread out, you know, people go out and do their own thing. And then when it's times of year, when everything there's abundance or there's, you know, it takes a lot of work to get a lot done, then you come back together. Right. I think that's a very um, beautiful and kind of organic way. And that, speaks a lot as to why this has worked for so long. Because again, the, the Mabuti have lived for thousands of years, thousands. And I say that because it's so mind boggling, right? Because to, today we like to kind of say, oh, our society is so great, but we've only been here a few mm -hmm. hundred years. Like America has only been here since the 1600s, you know, even the UK, you know, the British empire stuff like that has only been there a few hundred years. The Greek, 
you know, the Romans, they have only existed uh, what their entire span was one or 2000 years. But these ancient African cultures have existed for thousands, tens of thousands of years, maybe even hundreds of thousands, like the Khoisan people. If that doesn't show you, you know, what, what the importance of these things are, I don't know what will. Like, if we're already concerned about our society collapsing after a few hundred years, what does that say for our approach? You know, yes, it has, has, has created a lot of a lot of stuff, you know, yes, we did a lot of things, but if we go extinct in the next hundred years, what does it matter? What does it matter? You know, imagine like, imagine like uh, you push your children, you know, to do amazing things. And at the age of 20, they accomplished so much stuff. They, you know, became billionaires or whatever at the age of 20. And then at the age of, you know, 21, 22, they got so depressed that they killed themselves. They said, oh, there's, there's no meaning. There's no point. You know, I hate myself, what I did to the environment, or they have no friends and all this other stuff. And so they off themselves, you know, the, is, is that still good? Like, do, do you think that's a, <laughs> do we consider that a, a success? You know, that's, that's, that's kind of how I see, you know, our current society with America and, and colonialism and Western and capitalism is like, yes, we accomplish a lot of things, but at what cost? I say that all the time because it's, oh, it's, I just don't see people thinking about it that way. You know, again, if we, if we go extinct in the next couple of decades, what, 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 what was the whole point of all this? You know, but uh, sure people would disagree. <laughs> Unfortunately for us, neither the economic, political, or social structures of Western society are conducive to cooperation. When our jobs and social status depend on outperforming our peers, with the losers being fired or ostracized without regard to how it hurts their dignity or their ability to feed themselves, it's not surprising that competitive behaviors come to outnumber cooperative behaviors. Yep, because that's, that's what's rewarded, right? The competitive. But the ability to live cooperatively to live cooperatively is not lost to people who live under the, dis the destructive influences of state and capitalism. Social cooperation is not restricted to societies like the Mabuti who inhabit one of the few remaining pockets of autonomy in the world. Living cooper cooperatively is a possibility for all of us right now. Indeed, like we, even to this day with this huge, hugely competitive environment, Many of us highly, highly value cooperation and collaboration, right? We say that all the time in our work. We say we want to build a collaborative, cooperative team. But the problem is we turn around and have the overall structure of our company or our economy be based in these exploitative, competitive, you know, behaviors. And so, you know, if that, that's, that's delusional. You know, if we say we value cooperation, why do we reward competition? You know, that's to me, that's hypocr hypocrisy, that's delusion, that's non nonsensical. You know, if you say you, you, you want competition, then <laughs> what, what, what happens when, you know, you, you run out of your resource and you, you burn out all your people then all this other stuff happens from it, right? And if you say we want collaboration, why don't we build an, our entire... Uh, organization structure around that why don't we build our society around that you know we, we need to we need to align our our values with you know our reward system with our profit you know with our interest with with the things that we're building Ugh. anyways let's continue almost done here earlier earlier this decade in one of the most individualistic and competitive societies in human history state authority collapsed for a time in one city. Yet in this period of catastrophe, with hundreds of people dying and resources necessary for survival sorely limited, strangers came together to assist one another in a spirit of mutual aid. The city in question is New Orleans. After Hurricane Katrina struck in 2005, man, that was, too, that was a long, I don't know, for some reason it seemed like it was, because I remember that, but 2000, 2005, I was in uh, fifth grade. So it feels like I was, Feels like I was so much older at that, that time. It feels like that was just a few years ago, 2005. Wow. 
Initially, the corporate media spread racist stories of savagery committed by the mostly Black survivors and police and National Guard troops performing heroic rescues while fighting off roving bands of looters. It was later admitted that these stories were false. Look at that, that propaganda. In fact, the vast majority of res rescues were carried out not by police, uh, not, yeah, not by police and professionals, but by common New Orleans residents, often in defiance of the orders of authorities. Wow. I have a source here, so I'll look at that. The police, meanwhile, were murdering people who were <laughs> who were salvaging drinking water, diaper, diapers, and other living supplies from abandoned grocery stores, supplies that would otherwise have been ultimately thrown away because contamination from floodwaters had made them unusable, un unsaleable. Yeah, that's a huge problem, right? Like we we see this all the time. Like look at you know homeless people who are trying to get some food from like trash or whatever. And, you know, the police often are there not to protect people, but to protect the property, right? The, the property of the landowners or the, you know, the store owners. And yeah, yeah, they should have this argument. Oh, the store owners are just, you know, people too. They're just trying to make some money and all this other stuff, make, it, make a living. But if they're going to throw away all that stuff anyways, you know, why are you, why are you harassing people who are using stuff that you're going to throw away anyways? Right. All this stuff just gets dumped in a huge landfill. We, we have a horrible recycling you know, program. So it's not like you're going to turn around and, and reuse this stuff. It just literally gets thrown in a giant pile. Like a, a giant pile of trash. And yet we're, we have these police you know, officers who are who, who who are being told to not allow anybody to you know, take any of these resources or to you know, do anything with this stuff. Like you, this is literally a, a, a kind of sick problem you know um but let's not get into that right uh new orleans is not atypical everyone can learn cooperative behaviors when they have need or desire to do so sociological studies have found that in nearly all natural disasters cooperation and solidarity among people increase and it is common people not and it is common people not governments who voluntarily do I read that wrong. And it's common people, not governments, who voluntarily do most of the work carrying out rescues and protecting one another throughout the crisis. Beautiful. Yeah, that was that was a very, uh, very um, strong chapter there. Federal government abandoned New Orleans democracy now. New York Times, all false reported. Murders in roving camp and the Superdome. Let's look this up. And just check our facts real quick. What do you mean? Okay, here we go. Oops, I'm going back to the, the thing itself. I don't really doubt this too much because this is like we've seen stuff like this all the time. But, you know, might as well look up uh, this resource. Yes, yeah, so it's a real article. I'll probably read it at another day. I mean, look this up too. I'm trying to see, did did like media, did media outlets, you know, um, have fake news during Kachino or you know, um, let's see, fake news during Kachino. Look at that. Yep. The gallery. I don't look at your gallery, man. Oh, goodness. That's for you. Yeah. So, again, we could probably look this up more later, but <laughs> seems to check out.
we'll look at Snopes, but let's look what they're saying. Huh, look at that. Wow. See, look, like, just, wow. I mean, this is what we talk about all the time. Like people, people swear, oh, political correctness over oh, overblowing this race issue and stuff like that. But I mean, the, the evidence is right here, y'all. Like, <laughs> This is pretty damning evidence, you know. Again, we can look more into this. You can look more into this yourself, but this is uh quite problematic. But anyways, we'll end it there. Um, as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to me. Um, I, I don't know how long this ended up being, probably like almost two hours. So sorry. Um, I'll try to uh do this more regularly so I could do shorter videos, or maybe I just keep this as a long one. Most of my other videos, I want to be roughly 15, 20 minutes, but I think this series kind of has to be longer because um, this is already a long book and I don't want to cut up each chapter even shorter. So um, yeah, thanks for, for watching. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know what you learned. Um, if you, you know disagreed, uh, I'm sure many people will, and I'll, I'll be happy to uh, talk about some of these things, some of them, because I know some people would just have some really dumb, I'm, I'm just going to say it's going to have some dumb, you know, takes. They're not going to have any sort of logic. They're not going to have any sort of, you know, evidence. They're not going to have any sort of, you know, unbiased approach. They're going to, you know, go full pell into the to the races, uh, talking points and things like that. But, you know, for those who actually want to have a, a critical conversation, you know, um, and, and bring some some actual factual evidence and things like that, uh, maybe we can we can have a conversation about it. Um, and I don't know people not going to comment right now. Nobody watches my videos right now. This is more for people watching this, you know, in, in a year, in two years, in five years. <laughs> uh, if you've been watching this, this video uh, at that point. But, um, you know, we'll see where this goes. The, I guess history will tell. And as always, thanks and have a great day. See ya. Bye-bye.